Hello everybody, my name's Snapper, and today we're going to talk about the history of the handguns of Colt, and one of Colt's favorite pistols, the 61 Navy. Hold that thought. The 61 Navy. See? It's a whole new gun. I'll turn you guys over to Garrett now, who will explain the actual history of the 61 Navy. Comrades up, the moon's in the west, and the hounds of old Panic will find out our nest. We must be gone ere the dawning of day. The quadrille they seek shall be far, far away. Their toils after us shall ever be vain. Let them scout through the brush. Scour the plain, we'll pass through their midst In the dead of the night, we are lions in combat And eagles in flight Rouse my brave boys up a bad way Press hard on the foe Chase given on, we'll pass through their midst and we'll bathe in their gore. We'll, we'll come as a thunderbolt comes from the cloud. We'll sight the oppressor and humble the proud. You shall escape us and you shall be spared. For keen is our saber in vengeance is Hello everybody and welcome back to the History of the Handguns of Colt. I'm Garrett, I'm your host, and we are on to episode 8. We're really getting down there. We are talking today about the 1861 Navy. In our last episode we talked about this gun, the 1860 Army, and how much of a jump in technology this was to be able to take a full-sized a 44 caliber Dragoon and shrink it down to basically the same size as a 51 Navy using this rebated cylinder and also using 
Elijah K. Root's creeping loading lever. If you're interested in that, I strongly suggest you go back and watch episode 7, which is the 1860 Army, if you haven't already, because there is not a lot of information on the 1861 Navy other than we know that it really coincides with the story that took place with the 1860 Army. A lot of that is because there's going to be a fire in the Colt factory in a few years after the 61 Navy comes out and a lot of records are going to be lost. But without further ado, let's get into the 1861 Navy. First of all, what you have to know is, although Colt had the 1860 Army out, it was not the most popular revolver that he had. Neither was the 51 Navy. The Actually, the most popular revolver he had was the 49 Pocket model. But as far as Marshall full-size guns go, the 1851 Navy was just always very, very popular. This gun has an octagon barrel and it has the old style loading lever and we've talked about this before in multiple episodes this loading lever does not have as much mechanical advantage it has one uh, hinge point right here and it's just not as good a loading lever as what would come on the 55 root and then later on the 1860 army what we have here is the 1861 navy and we have three representations here i have a uberti 1861 navy I have a Pieta 1861 Navy and I have an original 1861 Navy. Now this particular 1861 Navy is very special because it belongs to my brother-in-law and has been in his family since it was brand new. The place where you see us doing our shooting out at the ranch on the range, this gun has been there since basically it was new. And so this is part of the ranch, part of the history of Part of our family's history my brother-in-law's family history and he was gracious enough to loan it to us for this video and we have had to do some work to it to get it up and running it has not been fired in well over probably 130 years so when we shoot it it's going to be the first time it's going to be on camera that this thing has been shot in probably 130 years so that's kind of a treat now like I said before, Samuel Colt had the 1851 Navy out, and it was just the most popular thing as far as a full-sized uh, Marshall revolver goes. It's 36 caliber, and it shoots a paper cartridge almost universally at this point. It shoots paper cartridges, not very much loose powder and ball being shot. So you're talking about 140 uh, grain conical with roughly, depending on the paper cartridge you're using, either 20 or 15 grains of powder behind that conical which the 20 grain charge the 15 grain charge is a little weak the 20 grain charge is actually a fairly potent round when you consider you're not using a round ball but 140 grain conical but you know everybody loved the 51 navy people today still love the 51 navy uh, as far as you go to buy a Colt, a cap and ball replica revolver today, you're going to 51 Navy either in 44 or 36 is going to be the most popular, probably the thing you'll find unless you find a Remington. But with all that popularity, there are still people that believe that the 44 caliber is just a little bit too much punch. Some people are sticking by their guns and love this old gun. And Nobody really knows for sure why Samuel Colt decided to upgrade the 51 Navy because he kept the 51 Navy line running the entire time that he was producing cap and ball revolvers, but he did want to slick it up a little bit. Now, as I've said before, go back and check out the 51 Navy video and the 1860 Army video in this series because most of the foundation for today's gun is laid in those videos. What we have here is basically an 1851 Navy from the barrel back. Nothing here has changed. We don't have the uh, Army or Dragoon grips. We still have the 51 Navy grips, 51 Navy internals, 51 Navy uh, trigger, 51 Navy grip frame, 51 Navy hammer, and 51 Navy cylinder, including the original Battle of Capeche cylinder scene. Everything from here forward, though, is completely new. And there are a few minor differences. All right, so now let's talk about some specs and differences between the 1851 Navy and the 1861 Navy. Now I'm gonna point out to you here, of course, we have the octagonal barrel, 
of the 1851 Navy. We have the single hinge point of the old style loading lever. And that's basically it. Um, there's just not a lot going on with the 1861 Navy. Let me bring up the 1861 Navy. And as you can see, we now have the rounded 1860 Army style barrel. We have blade front sights, which all of them shipped with blade front sights. And we have the, what they call the rack and pinion. We have the 55 Elijah K. Root patented loading lever, which if you watch right there, you can see the nubbins, it ratchets down, gives you a lot more mechanical advantage. Now, this is not exactly like an 1860 Army in one respect. I'm gonna pull up this fluted 1860 Army here. Actually, let's pull up this original. All right, here's an original 1860 Army. Now, I want you to notice right in here the actual ramrod, not the loading lever, but the actual ramrod is 44 caliber all the way through. And down here on the 61 Navy, if you look, that's 36 caliber to that point right there. But as it goes in, we come up to 44 caliber. Therefore, there is an actual physical stopping point at the cylinder there, but it still means that this is a very, very strong loading lever, especially for a little 36 cartridge compared to 44. Other than that, this front end is 1860 Army through and through with only one other difference. All 1861 Navy ship with a seven and a half inch barrel. However, if you are going to get a Pieta replica, we have an issue. The Pieta replica 1861 Navy, for some reason, has an eight and a half inch barrel. But let's talk about the first shipment of this gun and when it came out. Now, if you'll recall in our 1860 Army video, we talked about the no patent law that plagued Colt for the year of 1860 and part of 1861. We do not have a history of the 1861 Navy, at least I don't, and I've read a lot. And like I said, if you guys know where there's any military testing or anything, let me know in the comments below. But what I have is four days after the war was declared, on April 16th of 1861, the very first shipment of 50 1861 navies goes out of the Colt factory and into the waiting arms of the Union Army. There are some interesting things to note about this first batch. Of the first batch of 50, at least nine of them were fluted cylinders. All right, so if you haven't seen our 1860 Army video, this is a Cimarron reproduction of an early 1860 Army with a fluted cylinder. And this is basically how the 1861 navies with the fluted cylinder would look like they don't have a rolling grave they just have the serial number stamped between the flutes and it would look a lot like this like i said of course this is the 1860 army so the front of it would be a little more narrow now you have to remember this is the same point in time that colt is putting out this the fluted cylinder 1860 army and as like i said before go back and watch that episode as you'll recall there was some issue with exploded cylinders and it, he really quickly fixed that issue but it always had a bad stigma and people were afraid to use the fluted cylinder 1860 army so we know that at least nine could be as many as 30 of the original 1861 navies in 36 caliber came with the fluted cylinder and we actually have their serial numbers. And their serial numbers are, serial number one is fluted cylinder, number two, three, 11, 16, 29, 30, 40, and number 73, which was actually in another shipment, all have fluted cylinders, and we know they still exist to this day. We also know that there are three more guns that have fluted cylinders, 1861 navies, but they are from farther down the line in the later 1860s and they show signs of being tampered and many experts agree today that those particular three are fake. So like I said, if you have a fluted cylinder 1861 Navy in 36, you might want to hang on to it because there's only nine known to exist. Also to note that of the 1861 Navy's complete production, only about 100 of them were ever known to have the four screws. So let's talk about the four versus three screw models. As we have already discussed in our 1860 Army video, 
This is what we call a three screw model. As you can see, it has three screws here. And if we turn it over, you can see the screw heads. Three screws here that hold the framework together. There's no cut up here. Let's go over here to this Uberti model. And you will see that both the Uberti and the Pieta replicas are four screw models, which is kind of a misnomer because like I said, we only know that around a hundred four screw models were ever made. The four screw models are like this. Of course, we have one, two, three, four screws. That's technically, as I've said before, it's technically a five screw because there's one here and one here. And this has a cut in the recoil shield right here so that a stock will roll down over that screw and latch up in to that cut right there. And you have this little divot down here on the grip where a screw would go in to tighten and you can put a stock on it. As you will see on this original, no divot. And that's actually kind of cool to see because like I said, nearly all of the originals made will not have the cut and will not have the four screw. They will be simply three screw models. If you do have an original that is a four screw model, I would get that appraised because like I said, there is only around 100 of them in existence that we know of. Okay, so the 1851 Navy generally shipped with a brass trigger guard and grip frame. A lot of times they were actually nickel plated so you couldn't tell it was brass until years later. Some of them did ship with a steel grip frame and contrary to popular belief, not all of those were made in London. There were quite a few of them made in America and not all guns made in London had a steel grip frame. All right, so if you look here at the uh, Uberti 1861 Navy replica, you'll see we have a steel or iron trigger guard and grip frame all the way around. And that's, that's not incorrect. There were actually many, many of these that shipped out. However, due to the fire, we're not sure exactly how many were brass and how many were steel. No records were kept. Uh, and no studies have really been done on the subject as far as I know on the 1861 Navy. However, something interesting that we do know is the military reports receiving some guns with a mix, either a brass trigger guard and steel back strap or vice versa. One other thing to note that over half of the guns that were shipped out with brass frames were actually nickel plated brass frames. So this is correct of course this is an original one here this is correct but a lot of times you would see these and possibly even this one if you look at it there's a little bit of nickel remaining a lot of times you would see these come out of the factory with completely nickel plated brass so you wouldn't have known the difference all right so now that we've gone over the specs and the changes between the 51 navy and the 61 navy let's talk about samuel colt and what he's doing at this time now, if you remember, I've covered most of what Samuel Colt's doing all the way up to 1860, of course, in the 1860 Army video and the 55 Root video. But let's get into a little bit more detail about what's going on here. Now, we know that in 1855, Samuel Colt built a house called Armsmere on the property where the Colt factory was located. And it was a very large house. I'm going to read a description that was given to it by a contemporary of Colt's time. And they called the place Armsmere, which means Meadow of Arms. It was described contemporary thus. It's an Italian villa in stone, massive, noble, refined, yet not carrying out any decided principle of architecture. It's like its originator, bold and unusual in its combinations. It features a low-pitched roof, heavy bracketed cornice, round arched doors and windows, iron balconies, Italian towers and details and Turkish domes and pinnacles. Now the Colts actually moved into Armsmere in 1857 and they started developing gardens. They had landscape architects. Cleveland and Copeland provided the plans. They had very unusual glass dome conservatories that were inspired by London's Crystal Palace. This estate contained some 2,600 feet of greenhouses, had some ponds, some fountains, and even a deer park. Now this house was the primary residence of Samuel Colt and his family and they lived pretty lavishly in this place. They held big parties in here and it was really the highlight of Hartford society. Now about this time, as you'll recall, Samuel Colt was going through some difficulties with local papers and a thing called the Vigilance Committee. People who were very upset and questioned his loyalties about whether he would be making guns for the North or the South and just really where did his loyalties lie. 
And he cleared all that up because in May 16th of 1861, he was commissioned as a full colonel in the Connecticut militia. And he would raise what would become known as Colt's Revolving Rifles of Connecticut Regiment. And his vision for this was that they would be a group of men over six feet tall, was going to be an impressive outfit, and they would all be armed with his root revolving carbine or rifle. And we haven't really covered that, but here's a picture of it right here. Now, this would have been a good deal, but as you recall, Samuel Colt is having a really hard time at this point with gout. We've discussed that before. And at this point, he's walking with a cane, but as 1861 wears on, he's being carried a lot of times because anybody who's had gout knows that without medication, that is one of the most painful things you can have and you can't even walk. And that's kind of the condition he was in. Also, you will recall that his daughter Lizzie had died just a year prior. And this is a real turning point for Colt. He's actually lost three kids at this point and his wife Elizabeth is with, pregnant with another child, which will be stillborn. Colt is just kind of at the bottom of the barrel as far as emotionally. If you read the book Arms Mirror, which is basically written by Elizabeth Colt, she talks about how that he doesn't talk to her, he doesn't talk to Elijah K. Root, he doesn't talk to Richard Jarvis, he doesn't talk to anybody in his factory. All he does is he gets up at four o'clock in the morning goes to work, stays there till 11 o'clock or midnight at night, and then comes back, gets two or three hours of sleep, not talking to anybody, goes back to the office and continues to work. Designing firearms, working on contracts, he just completely buries himself in his finances and his factory. I believe this is part of what would kill him later on. He really did work himself to death at this point. However, that's not saying that the people in the factory were having a bad time. Colt set up a 10 hour workday, which was something that was not heard of at the time. He kept his employees happy. Something strange you will find is that a lot of people that started working for Colt when they were 17, 18 years old, they would start working at the factory then. Most of them retired there in their 70s and stayed there the whole time. They were not unhappy workers. Colt hired a lot of immigrants who brought their own music and cultures to the place. Like you know, he set up housing that was like their own little villages. And at one point he even had a band that played German polka for all of his German immigrant workers that were there at the time. And like I said, he was one of the first people to set up a 10 hour workday. People worked six days a week and they were relatively happy. They weren't very far from their homes. They lived on the place and he kept his factory going. Now, in 1861, he would crank the factory up. He would go from working just one shift to working double shifts and going a full 24 hours. So at one point they were doing 12 hour shifts. His people were relatively happy, like I said, and they knew it was not for long term, it was just for military output. So what was the Colt factory putting out at this point? Well, at this point they'd gotten up to a thousand 1860 army revolvers a week. And they would also put out 300 1861 navies a week. Why, you may ask? Well, because the 1851 navy is still out and people love it and they really don't see the advantage in paying more money for another 36 caliber revolver that basically does the same thing as the 51 navy but has a round barrel and a different loading lever. Now, the 1861 navy would be purchased by both the Army and the U.S. Navy with the Army purchasing 3,500 and the Navy purchasing 3,800. That is a drop in the bucket compared to their purchases of the 51 Navy and the 60 Army. So yeah, this gun isn't really doing all that good, but you know, it's something new and it costs more than the 51 Navy. So anytime they can sell it, they will. This gun actually comes out at a price of $20 a piece. As we've said before, the 60 Army was $24 when it first came out. And that was still very expensive. And people would buy this gun used because the few that were coming out were all going to the military. On the used market, you could get $40 for this gun in 1861. So they suddenly had an epidemic of soldiers, quote unquote, losing their 61 navies. 
and they would fine the soldiers $25 a piece if one of these was misplaced. However, that soldier was actually taking this gun, selling it to someone for $35 or $40. They would pocket the extra money and then pay their fine, and they still came out sm smelling pretty good on top. So eventually the army caught on to this and started charging $40 a piece for a lost 1861 Navy, and that kind of ended the issue. And you might ask, why so few for the actual federal military? Well, the fact of the matter is they already had plenty of 51 navies on hand and they were going to keep buying 51 navies. They, like everyone else, saw no need to upgrade to this particular gun for most places. Like I said, what happened was when they did start running a little low on 51 navies, they would buy some 61 navies to make up the difference. And so that is basically where most of that came from. We do know that quite a few were actually sold to local state militias. We don't know how many because the records are not on file anymore, of course, because of the fire, and it's very hard to track down state records versus federal records. So we don't know exactly how many were there, but we do know that many, many governors, especially in the East, would send representatives out to buy the guns and they would buy the slicker new guns. What you find is a lot of states further to the west are sticking with the 51 Navy and so still keeping its numbers up pretty well inflated over the 61 Navy for its entire run of its life. People out west like that octagon barrel. Now Samuel Colt was medically discharged from the military as his rank of colonel, which he actually had gotten somehow in the 1850s, but he was actually discharged on June 20th of 1861 for medical reasons. As I stated before, he couldn't walk. He was not going to lead a group of men, no matter how fine of technology they had in their revolving rifles into battle. Uh, things were going downhill fast for him at this point. But he's keeping his nose to the grindstone. Not only is he working on the 61 Navy, but he is also working on one final cap and ball revolver that we will get to later. So, now that we've talked about the history, what little there is, the specs, and what was going on with the 1861 Navy in the early years of the Civil War, let's go out and shoot these and see what we think. We have the Pieta, the Uberti, and the original. I can already tell you I'm favorably leaning toward the original even though I've never shot it just from the way it handles. So. All right, so let's load up our original Colt 1861 Navy. Today we are using paper cartridges that we made from Dustin Weiniger Guns of the West paper cartridge kit. I couldn't remember exactly what he told me the powder charge was, so I measured it and it throw, it's right at about 17 grains of powder, 3F. This is a Grafton Sons mix. And we are topped off here with a Arizgon Richmond Labs Lee conical bullet for 36 caliber. Now these bullets actually cast out at 390, so in Pietas they are sometimes very hard to load. And actually we've bent the loading lever on our Pieta replica spiller and burr trying to load them, even though this is dead soft lead. But this is where Elijah K. Root's patented loading lever comes in handy because with all that extra mechanical advantage it makes it really easy to do. All right, so we're gonna put her on half cock just like always. Guns on half cock, cylinders freed up. And let's see how she loads. Let's pop our paper cartridge right in there. And this is gonna be a little tough probably, but remember the chambers usually on originals are a lot bigger than chambers on the replicas. So let's see how she loads. It's a little stiff, not bad. That, that is a massive ring of lead. We got a great seal and we are ready to do that. Now this particular firearm, like I said, has not been fired in over 130, possibly 40 years. And so this is the first time we've shot it, but it does have one bad chamber we've noticed. So we are going to load just five. I have some Remington number 10s, sometimes original Colts with original nipples, sometimes like different caps. So we brought some CCIs in case these don't work, but let's see if the good original, not original, but Remington number 10s, they feel a little loose maybe, but we'll see if they fall off. All right, guys, first shots with this firearm since the 1800s. Like I said, this is a big piece of history for the ranch here, right here where we're shooting. This gun has been here for well over 140 years, almost since it was brand new. 
And so this is the first time it's been fired on this piece of land for, like I said, around 130 years. Let's see if we can get her to go. <laughs> There we go. That is because the spring on some of these old guns is weak. It's not a, a common issue with the gun itself. All right, now I know where I'm hitting. I was shooting over its head. You get a little nervous when you shoot these old guns for the first time. You never know what's gonna happen. Dropped her loading lever again. We're loading this original here and we did notice that there is an old hairline fracture right there on the top of that loading lever and that's probably why that loading lever is falling. So we are done shooting this original for today. Like I said, it's a very old gun, very uh, special gun, so we don't want to hurt it. I am glad that they let us bring it out here and shoot it. But anyway, that's enough of shooting the original. 1861 Navy. What I can say about the original is I missed those first few shots because I was aiming at the guy's neck right where we split from white to yellow and it does shoot high just like most Colts. Somebody is probably from being carried so much the front sight here is really wore down and so it shoots higher at about that's about 25 yards I was probably shooting two feet high and so I brought it down to the middle of his gut and I was able to put him right up there about where the paint line is. So it does shoot really high. Like I said, could be from holster wear. The spring is really heavy. Cap ignition was good. No cap jams, felt really good. Just felt like a quality piece. And I am very grateful that they let us bring it out here and shoot it, but we are done with this now. So without further ado, let's move on to some replicas. We have the Pieta right here and it is actually loaded with round ball. And let's go out here and see what we can do with it. All right, guys, we have five shots loaded up in the Pieta. This is loaded with 27 grains of loose powder and a round ball on each of these. So let's see what we can do. We've actually never shot this replica before. I have a feeling it's going to shoot high, so I'll aim low on that yellow plate. Actually, it shoots about right on. And hold it. Up, oh, up, oh, got a little cap jam. That tends to happen with replicas, guys. All right, let's go back around and hit that cap again, see if we get anything out of it. There we go. All right, so we still have a chamber in there that needs to go again, but you guys realize them round balls with 27 grains and a 36, that is, uh, that is a potent round, as you can see, that's hitting Harder than nine millimeter, probably not quite as hard as 45 ACP. I don't know if on paper it works out that way, but that's just, to me, the way it seems. This actually, I'm really enjoying this Pieta. Most of the time, in my opinion, Pietas come in behind Uberties, Uberties come in behind Originals. But uh, this one's kind of a dream. It shoots a point of aim, which is strange for a replica. All right, let's go for a bottle. Now I'll miss. Nope. All right, I think the Pieta is going to get a thumbs up outside of that cap jam. So we just shot cap and ball, loose powder, and round ball in, that, in the Pieta, and that was 27 grains of powder with a round ball. Now let's try the uh, Arizgon Bullet Richmond Lab uh, 36 caliber bullet. These are very hard to load usually in Pietas. As a matter of fact, in our Spiller and Burr Pieta, we bent the loading lever because even with soft lead, these things, like I said, cast out at 390, and so they don't always fit. Now, Pietas are notoriously bad about having a small loading port here, and as you can see, it's, it is tight, but bada bing, bada boom, and she goes. Now, another thing, the cone on the actual ramrod itself in here, not the loading lever, the ramrod, is rounded for round balls in Pietas, so it's going to deform the tip of the bullet. Kind of make it like a uh, like a Keith bullet. Anyway, so let's see how she goes in. I know it's going to be tough because these chambers tend to be right around uh, three seven four or so. They really a three seven five round ball is, fits really well. Let's see these three nine O's. 
Ugh. They are tight. Let's take a look at that ring of lead and paper we got out of there. That is a huge ring of lead, but it actually cut pretty well. And that is because of this loading lever system that the 61 Navy has. It is a good loading lever, and that's the reason people liked it back then. That's the reason we like it now. It just gives you more mechanical advantage. Okay, now that we have all six loaded, we are just going to set that hammer right down on that safety pin and see how well it works. Actually locks in really good. I really like this Pieta 61 Navy. Uh, it's only main downfall it has is it's not historically accurate because it has too long of a barrel but uh, the loading port's not bad i was actually impressed by that and uh, i actually could with this loading lever get the uh, 390s in it so let's go on over here and shoot some bottles and i knew i'd get a miss eventually move on It's attacking! It's attacking! When shooting the conicals, I don't know why the heavier bullets are just going straight through whereas round balls tend to bust the bottles up a little more uh, but those were all good hits except for I missed one there and I had a failure to fire all right let's go for that water bottle again hey, I don't know if I'm gonna hit the little ones today guys anyway I think that's all I'm gonna do with this Pieta for the moment I'm actually really impressed with this gun it shoots to the point of aim if you aim straight like not like me shaking like a leaf and like i said i don't like that it's a four screw but that's basically all you're going to get these days in a 61 navy like i said those are very rare in the originals the barrel on this gun is not crowned the barrel on the uberti is crowned but yeah i like this piata let's go on and shoot the uberti okay guys now we are going to shoot the uberti 1861 navy and there's a few differences, obviously. No markings on the top of the barrel. You birdie puts that all in the bottom. The barrel is crowned. Have a better knurling on the hammer. Should be all around better gun. This is actually Caleb's favorite gun. And he shoots this one really well. He's won a pumpkin carving competitions with it. But let's see what I can do. Let's start on the big center yellow and see where she's hitting. These are paper cartridges. Hi. <laughs> there we go. Cat, we got us a cap jam. Whoop, I think I got it cleared out. I might not have to cut. <laughs> All right, small target, see what we can't do. Woo! I don't think, I did, I just barely nicked the bottom, didn't I? There we go, I'll take that. Do it again. Guys, that's 15 yards. That is pretty good for me with a cap and ball revolver to be able to hit a two inch plate at 15 yards like that fairly consistently. Got one more cap here. Let's go back to the big one. All right. Once I remembered, remember I'm shooting three guns all in one day. The original shooting two feet high, the Pieta shooting right on. This one is a six o'clock, uh, as you can see, I don't know if you can see, but I held in the same spot. I'm about a half inch apart on those two I put on that big plate. Uh, this one is a six o'clock hold, which is my favorite. I just have to remember which gun I'm shooting and keep going back to that hold. So, hey, I love this gun. Uh, we've had this one for a long time. My brother Caleb, this was, I think, his first cap and ball revolver. The 51 Navy is always going to be my favorite cap and ball revolver but this particular cap and ball revolver is probably the best shooter we have it is the uberti 1861 navy now there's also another guy who will uh confirm how well these uberti 1861 navies are and that's blackie thomas over at shyman's forge he has one that he named stormborn has a whole video series on 
antiquing it, making it look really nice like an original. He loves that gun. Like I said, he named it. We haven't named this gun, but we may if we keep shooting it and liking it this much. Let's load it up with paper cartridges. Now, as you'll recall, that was, it was fairly stiff to load the Pieta because those chambers aren't quite what they ought to be as far as the width. These chambers are a little wider, not as wide as the originals. Let's see how it loads. All right, we're gonna stick the paper cartridge right here. And it goes right down in there. By the way, the Uberti has the correct loading lever in so it doesn't smash them, deform them. All right, let's see how hard that is to get that down in there. I would say it's somewhere in the middle like you would expect. It is not as hard as the Pieta, nor is it as easy as the original. Now, like I said before, this one does have a loading groove, if you can see that in there. It's just very, very shallow. Let's see what we can't do with this Uberti. We can miss. Cap in the hammer. And miss. You birdie 1861 Navy. Guns of the West, paper cartridges. Cap jam. I hit it, just didn't fall clear over. All right, the Uberti 1861 Navy. Still my favorite, but that Pieta is running really close. If the Pieta had the right length of barrel, I would uh, probably like it a little better even, but overall, the Uberti is a good gun. Let's go back and shoot that Pieta just a couple more times just for the fun of it. We have the Pieta again, and now we are loaded with 27 grains of loose powder and a round ball. And when you're shooting that combination, there's no room for a wonder wad. And I don't use the grease on the top for the most part. It's hard to clean up the gun afterwards. And if you read the historic manuals from Colt on loading cap and ball revolvers, they say do not use wads or grease. And so my experience is most open top Colt revolvers like this, even without any form of grease whatsoever, won't slow down and start dragging and stop till usually the 40th or 50th round. In which case, you know, that's a big battle if you're shooting that many rounds through a pistol in a day. All right, so by the way, no lube. This is the, this is the fourth cylinder we've put through this gun today and it's still running just fine. Ah! We're gonna have to go two-handed. There we go. I talked before about how people carried cap and ball revolvers all the way up into the 1880s, 1890s, even probably into the 1900s, some people. And some people will ask me, why would you carry an obsolete cap and ball revolver? It's so slow to reload. Well, there's an easy fix for that. You just make sure you get you two Duke Fraser production holsters, wink, wink, and carry two guns. All right, guys, let's see what 61 Navy's loaded with Dustin Weiniger's Guns of the West paper cartridge kit and a conical bullet will do at card table distances. I think they do the job. Card table distances. I think they do the job. all right we are back and that was kind of fun i want to point out a few things that i've noticed i had never shot this uh, pieta 1861 navy before today 
Uh, I was really impressed with this gun. It worked really well. It actually loaded decently. Has a little bit bigger cylinder gap than the other guns, but you know, that's okay. It kind of helps with fouling. Speaking of fouling, I just want to point out that we shot between the two replicas. We only put five rounds through the original because we were afraid the loading lever might break because we did discover a hairline fracture right there in the end of it. But we put over 110 rounds today through both of these replicas. By the way, still have not cleaned them. They're sitting here just like they were. And of all those rounds, we used zero lube of any kind. The paper cartridges, we didn't even lube them, even though Dustin sends a lube stick with them. We didn't lube them. We didn't run any wonder wads with the round balls. And neither of those guns even started to drag. That is the advantage of an open top Colt. And that is why Colt stuck with that design so much longer than many other uh, companies, especially like Remington. Back to our story. These were not uh, really well-loved firearms here in North America in the Civil War, or even the Indian Wars. Like I said, there just weren't a whole lot of them made. But they did find their place around the world. In one place in particular was Japan in what they call the Boshin War. Now, the Boshin War had to do with the Empire of Japan wanting to modernize and Admiral Perry showing up and actually foreigners showing up on their shores. The old samurai class did not like that and there was a civil war that went on there over that and surprisingly many many 1860 armies and 1861 navies made it to japan now i have seen estimates for how many went as high as 10,000. i find that number to be extremely high but there are many, many, many still surviving Japanese marked 61 navies, and there are actually a lot of them still in Japan today. So yes, there were a lot of them there. We don't know exactly how many, once again, due to the fire. But it did make its name over there with the uh, Japanese Empire, not necessarily with the Samurais. I'm sure they used them if they could get them. Likewise, the Confederacy never officially made a purchase of 61 navies nor did the confederate states but once again it was used over and over again by anybody who could capture one in the south and use it anyway the last 1861 navies left colt in the year of 1872. now for many years we thought that there were 38,843 of these firearms made in toll and I thought that was the truth too, but it turns out that's an R.L. Wilson number. And anything that you hear from R.L. Wilson, take with a grain of salt. Because the true number, as far as the last serial numbers that did leave the factory, we do have records for them. The last serial number to actually leave the factory was 38,775. So somewhere R.L. Wilson picked up 68 more. Uh, more than likely that was a fake he was trying to sell with that number on it and so he just wrote that in a book and that became gospel for many years. That's why you have to be very careful with Colt firearm history because what many people believe is absolutely gospel has been uh, tainted by R.L. Wilson. And if you want to hear more about how just corrupt that man was and the history of Colt firearms has been corrupted and tainted and just run in the mud so bad go over and watch seeing arsenal Lothias has a like a three hour video just on rl wilson and how most of what we think today of colt history is probably not right i avoid him like the plague where i can now there's one more thing we need to cover about the 61 navy and that is the assumption that this is samuel colt's favorite revolver and that it was what he considered the most beautiful revolver he ever made. I believe this to be true because I've heard it so much, but I've yet to find the original source that states that. If you guys out there know, let me know because I'm sure it's in a letter or something, but it is not cropped up in any of the books that I have read. We are pretty well done with the 1861 Navy. There's a few people I'd like to thank for helping me out with this episode. First of all, I want to thank Duke Fraser Productions because he provided the holsters that we use and I usually go bounce ideas off of him because he has a very vast knowledge of cult history. The second person I want to thank is Snappers Antique Firearms Unlimited who shot the opening for this video and once again someone else who I often bounce thoughts and ideas and 
ask questions of when it comes to cult history. And last but not least, I want to thank Dustin Weiniger who provided the paper cartridge kit for this video. And I want to thank my brother Caleb for purchasing the Pieta replica just for this video. He had already had the U-Birdie for many years and that was his favorite gun, but he did go out and buy this Pieta just for this video. So anyway, as always, trust in God. Keep your powder dry. Bye. We did it again. <laughs>